I want to really start telling people this. And I think this could be a message that We Go High talks about specifically, but, and everybody has different levels of being okay with this, but you got to be weed friendly to yourself. Mm. You got to be friendly to weed. You know what I mean? Like everywhere you go, like you have to make yourself a state of prohibition. I mean, of, of, uh, of ending prohibition. Why can't I talk? You have to be in a constant state of ending prohibition. That's real. That's what I was thinking about, like looking for a weed friendly place. It's yeah. like, you're probably gonna have to make it weird, weed friendly That's wherever right. you are. Yeah. And so we're all in a state of act- active activism. That's right. We're living the path right now. And so for me, it's like, it's not about doing something different than you're clearly already doing. It's about like being <clears throat> clear that the thing that you're doing, where you're going, being queer, smoking weed, having a dog, those are things that you do to enrich your life and to live into your truth. And so that has to go with you everywhere. And if it's it doesn't look like it's obvious where you're going, like that's your opportunity to make it true for somebody else. This episode of Dear Jessamine has profanity, sex talk, weed smoking, and a bunch of other shit that's just not for everybody. You also may not agree with the stuff we say or how we say it. And we think that's great. We're recording today from Stolen Ohlone Land. We promote cannabis medicine to people over 21. If you're not 21, come back when you are. Are we recording? Yeah. Yeah, all right. Oh, yeah, look at that. Yeah. Hey, Jasmine. Hey, Ash. Um, what are you laughing about? I laugh every time I say that. Yeah, you do. What's that about? Is it funny? It remains hilarious that we've been sitting here for the last hour and just decide to say hey. Hour? Our whole lives. Mm, <laughs> it's okay, the sexual yeah. education curriculum for the Unitarian Universalist. I see. Okay. People. <laughs> Anyway, um, well, do you want to tell me what you're calling in today, mate? Mm, I feel like I should be calling in patience. It is. Um, what's funny about that? I'm sorry. I can't giggle. Is this no, a no, I mean, no just, laughing show? No. Can I tell you really why I said that about the laughing? Yes. Because sometimes I feel like there's a compulsive laughter that happens with people. Mm. And I've noticed it with one of our colleagues in particular, but somebody that I work with very closely. And I, when it happens, I always want to just be like, just let it be there. Because I think that especially people who are uh, socialized as women laugh to lessen tension or to try to like make ourselves feel better or like, just like make a joke somehow. And so that when you start sometimes like that and you laugh, I wonder if, especially like having been here with you this last little bit and knowing that like we're like under the gun time wise and like getting shit figured out and it feels like artificial to me. And so it's not artificial. It's I definitely based on nervousness, but I totally am <laughs> only slightly annoyed and thinking it's funny that you're talking about somebody laughing at inappropriate moments. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, like I definitely, okay. Heard. Is that, no, no, no. That, I'm not trying to shut you down. I'm just like, Justin's talking about somebody laughing wrong. It's funny. No, I didn't mean laughing wrong. I just meant like, am I making you feel, or like, is the. No, I mean, we're performing. We're on stage. We just, the curtain, you know, it's time. Yeah. yeah. It's a little bit nervous. Yeah. Do you feel like you're performing here? A hundred percent of the time. Yeah. Wow. How interesting. I'm, totally. I'm not unaware that people are watching. Mm. I hope people are watching. <clears throat> But you want to show them something specific. Man, you need to chill. This what? Is, I feel like what's so wild is like, yeah, like if I was nervous, would you come at somebody like that? Like, oh, are you fucking nervous? Okay, you know what I mean? Sorry. I think I'm provoked. Okay, so today is the second day of the fast. Yeah. Uh, we are at 2.43 in the afternoon. And during the Baha'i fast, you fast from sunup to sundown. And I always feel like the hours right before sunset are the hardest hours Mm -hmm. that's the most intense and so i'm definitely feeling the heat of that a little bit and also today i've been feeling very like speculative and very comfortable with like Mm. just like looking at all the different details of things so i can see how the way that i expressed this came out judgmental and aggressive and um i can't even say that i didn't mean it that way because i'm sure that i did subconsciously but I don't want for you to feel that way if that makes sense and if all those things can live together. So I apologize for 
coming at you. You know what I mean? Mm. I didn't mean to come at you. No worries. Uh, yeah, I do think I do a little nervous laughter. I don't really think about it that much, which is probably why I was feeling a little defensive. Um, I don't mean it to be like disingenuous. And yeah, on the note of performance, I'm <clears throat> very, 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 very different when I'm all alone in my room or in my house, which I've actually experienced a little bit more of lately than usual. Um, than I am in front of anybody else. And certainly than I am in front of strangers who I can't even see. Yeah, of course, I'm performing something. Performing being okay with that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. If nothing else. It's it's like a lot. Yeah, I mean, I would say too recently, wow, now you've really asked a question. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been receiving a lot more like correspondence from people who listen to the show mm -hmm. and also being recognized in public for the mm -hmm. first time for the show. Mm -hmm. Supposedly, I have my theories about that, but. <clears throat> what are your theories? Well, you know, I don't think of myself as being very noteworthy. And so to come up to me and be like, oh, my God, you're on this podcast. I really I I had this whole line of reasoning that since we post the uh, video clips of the show on your Instagram now, people have access to knowing that I'm on the show <laughs> at all or what I would look like. But that I don't think it comes from like a, I don't know, I guess I assume it doesn't come from like some kind of like devotion to the way that I create or something. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? How Seems interesting. You, wow. What? That is really interesting. You always say that about this stuff. No, I just don't feel that way about you or about me or about the show or about performance. I'm like really just thinking about what you're saying. And um, I feel you. I just didn't, I hadn't considered it that way. And I mean, I do think that having people look at your art, knowing that people are looking at your art mm -hmm. makes it, I think, harder to make the art because you're like thinking about what other people are thinking of it or like how they're going to engage with it. I think we all engage with that concept really differently though. Cause I'm a, I'm a athlete. So people looking at my art has meant that if I go super, super hard and do a good job, they'll all clap for me. Do you know what I mean? And it's mm. not why I go hard and it's not why I play the sport, but it is like a real nice part of it. So we're in that situation right now where we're like talking to somebody, but we can't see them. Like while doing the show just now. Yeah. I, I really love that. Like, I don't know. I don't, I hate so much whenever I can look at people like now I'm starting to get a little bit more into it. Like being on zooms and Google meets and like actually like keeping the grid view up. That's one of my practices now is like, mm. keep the grid view up and actually look at people when they're reacting and mm. like engage with how they're reacting. But I am so distracted by how other people behave mm -hmm. that like, even that much human connection is like, and in this very particular way, there's an intimacy to digital communication that does not exist in real life. Like it's, it's weird to me how like you can observe someone in digital space in a way that you never would in real life. Like you wouldn't like really look at them like that. And maybe we should be engaging with mm. each other that intimately, but like I have not found that I do. And so the intimacy of it definitely throws me off, especially whenever people are like commenting on shit that they're like, like, oh, I noticed this in the background or like I noticed mm. that thing that you were doing or whatever. And I'm just like, what? Like, why are you looking at that? Or like, mm. I get it and I like, I got it. But anyway, to this, a concept. I think that the fear of what other people think of you, though, stops people from making art because it's like, well, what are some what are they going to think or like how are they going to clap for me? What if they don't clap for me? Yeah, I um, I was telling you I had an experience with that this week, one of a very formative experience mm. for me where I did an event. It was my it was my great fear realized um, you do an event and nobody comes mm. and um the thing is, even that groan is something that like I want to question in myself or like I think that there's a place of like you said greatest fear realized. Yeah. I groan. No. Oh, her feel me. Yeah. I don't want you to be uncomfortable ever. I get that you get big lesson also. I'm like, mm, don't be treating my girl like that. We all do. I mean the universe. Yeah. I feel like it's for me, it bring it begs the question of like, why do you need anyone to look at you? Why do you need Definitely. for people to be there? Why do you need why do you need someone to clap? You know, Definitely. like where does that come from? And like I definitely 
very early on in life got a lot of validation from having people clap and having people say like, good job. Or you, I really enjoyed that thing that you did. Like it was always singing. And then it was like some variation on performing and now coming to this place of like, okay, I get that. That's why I'm, I get that we're here to shine. We're here to be bright beams of light, but ultimately like if everybody is shining, what difference does it make if someone else is looking at you shining? So this is one of my questions for this week. That's a, that's something that I'm calling in this week. You asked yeah, before, what absolutely. are you calling in this that's week? 100%. That's something I'm calling in, that question. I'm calling in. Wow, this is what I'll say, and maybe it'll get me there. I feel very exposed, like I wasn't mm -hmm. supposed to say that I'm performing on the show. And I feel, not that you made that true, I feel. Nope. Yeah. <laughs> I'm having the reaction. When you said like, I don't want you to feel sad. I'm like, ah, I don't want you to feel sad. See, 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 Yeah, no, I'm feeling a little bit like, oh, fuck, maybe I said the wrong thing. And I mean, that's the performance. All of that is me like, um, you know, maybe I, maybe I missed the basket. And now I'm like running back to defense. And I'm like, oh, fuck, what did I do wrong, you know? Um, just so you know. So I'm like, okay, what am I calling in? I don't know. Something that could make up for my fumble. No. Oh my God. <laughs> so yeah, you asked, is this a performance? Absolutely. These mm -hmm. are the ways in which I'm just, I'm just giving you the topography of the performance. Anyway, um, <laughs> to you, what am I calling in? I've still not said, you know, I've been really cold the last few days. So I'm calling in like, um, a little bit more of my fire. I think part of it is that I have not slept super. <laughs> I don't even At know what word. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, minimal sleep, but also just really weird. Like I'd be asleep, I'd wake up, I'd be asleep, I'd wake up, I'd be for the last. I'm like, do I have a newborn? What's happening? <laughs> Why are we? I don't. Um, but I am really tired, and it's affecting everything. My cognitive functioning is certainly being affected. I'm just like slow rolling over here. So I am calling in. I think warmth, but uh, maybe also like the way that compassion can feel warm, mm -hmm. like a concept of warmth, like mm -hmm. that warmth that like uh, you give to somebody kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm calling that in for myself, from, from myself, <laughs> a little bit of warmth. Um, you want to get into most dairy query? Yeah. Is that the first, <laughs> the first thing we're doing, the dairy query? Sure. Yeah. Let's do the dairy query. All right. Hi, I love the podcast and I appreciate y'all being so transparent with us and sharing these parts of yourselves with us listeners. My question is more moving slash living related. My partner and I currently live somewhere expensive in a not ideal living situation, in parentheses, next door to my family with three other roommates in our house. Damn, that's real. That is real. Uh, and we, we've been looking all over the U.S. to move so we can finally get married and live on our own. We want to get out of California and have no idea where to go next as a queer couple without a job or any other factor pulling us anywhere in particular. My question to y'all is after having traveled throughout a lot of the U.S. recently in your RV, what are some of the coolest weed friendly, queer friendly, dog friendly places you have visited? And could you see yourself living in slash moving to or recommending to other queers to move to? Any tips for moving from a stable living situation to a new place and doing new things? Signed by and large spelled B-I and large. <laughs> That's very cute. I love that. Okay, so by and large is saying that they and their partner live currently in a situation that they're over. They're tired of living next door to their family and they're tired of having three roommates. They and their partner want to get married, but they're wondering where they should move. They don't, they're not like particularly pulled anywhere specific and they're looking for like queer friendly, weed friendly, was it dog friendly? They're, they're looking for chill places to live and they're wondering since we have been a few different places a both recently about. and yeah just in life they're wondering if we have any recommendations for cool weed friendly queer friendly dog friendly places to call home and uh and or places that we would consider calling home and also they're wondering if we have any tips for moving from a sticks and bricks life to a no they're they're talking about from they they said from a stable living situation to a new place doing new things, which mm -hmm. I think can be interpreted a few different ways. They're not saying that they want to live mobily, so it's not specifically like going from a house to some other type of vessel or living dwelling, but they are saying that it would be 
going from a situation that they know to a situation mm -hmm. that they don't know. Mm -hmm. And that is some real shit. The first question is, what are some of the coolest weed friendly, queer friendly, dog friendly places you visited? And could you see yourselves living in or moving to or recommending to other queers to move to? I would really recommend Durham, North Carolina <laughs> to someone who is looking for a place to live. Like, I feel like... <laughs> I can't speak for you, but I left Durham because the universe told me to leave Durham. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I would not have left Durham. I love Durham so much. And it is changing a lot. It's becoming gentrified as fuck. Like so many Californians are moving to North Carolina and specifically to the Raleigh-Durham area. And it is dramatically changing just the energetic tone of the area. And I mean, in addition to changing the cost of living. Yeah. And and it also just, it changes the culture, like the things that people are doing, the types of places that you would go to hang out. But there are still, it's very queer, very black, very, um, I think that for the South, it's pretty weed friendly. It's pretty like, like people talk about it, you know, or like, it's not, I think it's pretty chill. There's a overall. pretty cool cannabis justice organization that's based, uh, in, Durham. based in Durham. Yeah. Called Bego High. Called, dot exactly. Info, if you need to look it up. Yeah. So there's, it's not, but it is the sort of place where like, you're going to need to like find your weed. It's not, you're not going to be able to uh, just go to the dispensary like you can in other places, which there are, I'm, well, okay. I, I have like some dream places that if I was like going to just pick a place in mm -hmm. the country, there are, and I guess now is the time to say those. So, I mean, I think my first one would be Richmond, Virginia. Uh huh. Interesting. Um, I love Richmond so much, and I know that it has changed a lot too. Like for people who have been there for a long time, it is dramatically different now than it once was. But weed is now legal in Virginia, and I think that Virginia is pretty. I mean, I, I feel like Richmond's pretty queer. What do you think? Yes. Yeah, like it's like a pretty chill place to be totally. and the cost of living is not outrageous I'm, i don't think anywhere in the south outside of like atlanta or different places in florida or new orleans or nashville, nashville. maybe um i don't think anywhere is really going to be the same cost of living as like a california for example in general i think california as a on the whole is extremely expensive expensive state to live in Pretty what much y'all go anywhere and you're probably gonna pay less than California. <clears throat> Not anywhere, but yeah. Well, okay. In terms of places we visited, I think I would live in Vermont real fast. Okay. Although, yeah, I don't know. The winter is a, a real yoga practice, <laughs> but that's all it is. No more than anything else. Vermont was definitely going to be one of the, was going to be a place that I said, <laughs> excuse me, but I remember when we were there and talking to people who live there, they talked about like the, um, the poverty is the word that comes up for me, but just totally. like the, um, industry is an issue in in vermont like i think that it's and that, that could also bring your work with you sometimes. yeah you gotta like byo work but aren't um, they i think maybe we didn't talk about this while we were there but there were maybe it wasn't vermont anyway there's these really mm -hmm. interesting programs i think it is where the government pays people yeah it was it was vermont it was when i was in college we were talking about it how the how vermont had all this money set aside to basically give people a bonus to relocate with um remote jobs oh interesting to Vermont to yeah. the economy yeah very interesting yeah <clears throat> anyway well that yeah it's low population and like the folks who live yeah it's like i feel what you're saying i think i relate to that style of white person mm. do you what know what i mean style of white person like working class sometimes not working sometimes growing your own food style hippie white mm -hmm. person that a lot of whom live in in vermont well, and so I do feel like Vermont is really like for white people, though, especially with temperature, yeah. like it's very cold there mm -hmm. in general. And I felt like my body was not here right. for it, totally. like maybe in the summer, but in the cold months is no good. Mm. It is beautiful and it's not that expensive, I guess. Mm. I think New England is kind of expensive in general. Yeah, New England. I mean, I don't know. I feel like my experience in Massachusetts, for instance, was that. You're paying a lot in taxes, but you're also really getting a lot out mm -hmm. of it. Um, okay, Massachusetts, I will say, is yeah. weed-friendly, queer-friendly, dog-friendly. Yes. It's a real, like, um, 
yeah, Western Mass, where I lived, um, it was real like lesbians pushing a baby stroller kind of a mm-hmm. vibe, um, always with a dog, obviously. So that is just, I mean, if you don't know that already, like you should, that Western Mass is pretty pretty on this on this list of things really checks the boxes but it is expensive and it, the yeah. taxes in massachusetts are so expensive i, I really again you know your 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 highways are plowed your i mean it's stuff gets done so i will say it's one of the most organized places i think i may have ever lived but another part of that is all of new england is extremely white in my experience yes not every city in new england but new england as a whole and like just like i think the cultural ideals sometimes scream white people to Mm -hmm. me so that's a factor for sure it's also very cold like extremely cold i know i keep saying that but i'm like no it's it's important yeah a good portion of the year it's going to be winter (laughs) so like how it is in winter or how it is in summer is i think an important factor in where you decide to live yeah oh the other thing i wanted to say was that um we didn't we traveled up and down the east coast to many Mm -hmm. places that both of us had sort of already been ish or had been familiar with you know Mm -hmm. your new york's your washington dc's your virginia's um but we didn't when we left the eastern seaboard um we kind of skedaddled to Mm -hmm. california so Mm -hmm. we didn't I, i didn't have a whole lot of experience in the middle of really cool places although i've always said that i would move to madrid new mexico Mm -hmm. for sure interesting what do you think about madrid i don't need madrid specifically but i i and i don't know if i need new mexico but i do like it a lot like a lot a lot and i'm very interested in the earthship movement Mm -hmm. and um just living i i'm interested in desert living also so like uh, i don't know if my body would love it Mm -hmm. and the desert has such extreme temperatures like the temp- weather is a big factor for me. In Clearly, it's good. Yes. We're learning so much. <laughs> but like, it's like the factor. Oh yeah. But um, it's like it'll be very, very, very cold there, but also very hot there. Which, you know, I've always been interested in living in Texas. I think Texas is a really cool state. Why? So funny. I feel like growing up, I was like Texas and Virginia. I'll never live in those states. And Virginia was like, I don't know why I got this impression, but really early on, I was like, Virginia is the most racist state in the country. Oh, interesting. How can you gauge? Hey, how are you going to let Mississippi? Mississippi's Alabama, like, bitch. We are out stand here. in Al- the schoolhouse door. Arkansas. Come on, bitch. <laughs> like, literally are you joking. But right no, I'm Louisiana, like, Virginia. The mo- There's Florida. something about it that's like buttoned up. I think that's oh, what it is. Yeah. I think that's the Ooh, scariest yeah. thing. I hate prep school racism. It just Ugh, scares the totally. shit out of me, you know? It's yeah. terrifying. It's like, you're going to be Brett Kavanaugh. <laughs> you're going to be on the yeah. fucking Supreme Court. You're scary. Everybody's scary. Everybody's All of it's scary. scary. But that, that just got under my skin. So, and then Texas is like, okay, did anybody see Thelma and Louise? Are you up to this? I mean, I got to know. This isn't a game. I'm in deep shit and I gotta know what you're gonna do. I feel like we learned yeah, super we early it. on you just don't go to Texas. You don't learn the reason. It probably has to do with rape, but you just don't go to Texas mm. via Susan Sarandon's character in that movie. And ever since I've never looked back. I'm like, I don't need to be in Texas. <laughs> she mm. told me the truth. I don't need it. Is that anybody else's experience? I'd be so curious if people like had a stigma against Texas based on this really traumatic sure. movie you watched at age like eight. Literally. For sure that is. It was the also case. wildly empowering. <laughs> I mean, my dream state is Hawaii. Yeah. Um, but Hawaii is also complicated, expensive, hard to get a car, expensive to have a car. Colonizer. Yeah. You are invariably a colonizer. Volcanoes. Those two. Um, but very weed Lots friendly. Of gods and goddesses. Yeah. I mean, I guess so. We really can speak to like the Eastern seaboard. I also have always really loved Miami, like as a place. Mm. Uh, not like Miami Beach, like not like South Beach or like anything like that, but like the residential areas. Mm. And you know what else? I also really enjoyed Las Vegas. Oh my God. I am swear <laughs> to God, I'm like, my bad. There were three states and it was Florida. Florida was the third. And now I'm like, oh, why Vegas? You would live in Vegas? Why Vegas? No Ve- shade. You remember when we went to Vegas? We went to MJ BizCon and mm-hmm. we stayed in a part of Vegas that was like, no, I don't even remember seeing the strip. It was just like Ticky-tacky. very chill Las Vegas. It was Nevada. There's no trees, Jessamine. Yeah, but like it's weed friendly. Weed friendly usually means queer friendly. <laughs> like, 
Like, mm. I feel like weed really just brings you, all the good. Weed makes you you weed don't need to worry about around. shit when weed is legal. Um, but not. but yeah, I mean, I did think that that was an interesting place. But my number one recommendation would be somewhere in North Carolina, and Absolutely. I would specifically recommend the Raleigh Durham Triangle area. Um, which area, what parts of North Carolina would you recommend in what order? Well, okay. This is what I realized when I was like getting into my late te- teens and early twenties and we were really starting to pick up the old gentrification, mm-hmm. uh, operation, mm-hmm. um, operation, reduce all culture of this place and render it nothing. Okay. Mm-hmm. When that started happening, I was like realizing how much I was recommending to everybody everywhere I went that they moved to Durham. And so mm. I stopped doing it. No, yeah, totally. Um, not that I felt like I was doing something single-handedly, but I think we all play our, our part, mm-hmm. you know. I wanted cool people to move there because I was like, wow, nothing to do in Durham. And then all these, like, um, cool people started moving there, and I was like, fuck. <laughs> I think the reason that I feel comfortable recommending it now is because it's a lost cause. It is a lost cause. I feel a like Durham is up cost. the creek. Um, it is for sure. So, okay, Durham. No, but it's, no, it is the best. There's no two ways about that. You know what else? I really I like love, Greensboro now. Oh, Greensboro, I've fuck really yeah! Move to Greens- to enjoy. Move to Winston Salem. Yeah, or Winston Greensboro. is really fucking dope. Hell yeah! Oh my god! I Please, honestly, and make it more weed friendly. I enjoy the land up north on like the north, yes. like the where Virginia hits North Carolina on that top shelf. I see, feel like this is the area I wasn't telling people about. No, I feel you. That's where I would like to. Yeah, there's gorgeous there. lake lands and stuff up there that just nobody, y'all aren't ready. It's terrible. Don't move there. <laughs> Full of mud. Swamps, no, it's gross. so beautiful and it's like very reasonable cost and all the queers are moving there. <laughs> That's really north central North Carolina mm-hmm. is the move. Um, That's right. That's all I can speak to. I don't know anything about the Midwest. I know I've never been to the Pacific Northwest. I don't know anything about. Mm. I've been to South Dakota. Really love that. I would actually recommend Rapid City, South Dakota. I don't know why. I really oh, had a great yeah. experience there one time. Oh, cool. Uh, I have a good friend who loves Missoula, Montana. I was just gonna say Montana. I love so much. Mm. I don't know it to be weed or queer friendly, but it is so beautiful. It's got a big old sky, and it is yes, it is perfect. And I don't really care for any big cities ever yeah. for any reason totally. and would never recommend them personally but there are parts of them different cities that i've enjoyed and obviously all of them are fun like you can you've had a good time do. in philly me yeah That's i'm, I'm I, like tell me if i get it wrong no, please, you've had a good time good. slash have lived have like spent time with people you've lived in some of these places yeah. but like have spent time with fun queer weed friendly people yeah. in philly dc Every part of Brooklyn uh, and Queens, Manhattan, I could pass. But yeah, okay. No, Manhattan to New York City. My cousin used to live in Manhattan. That would be my, yeah. my pass on that one. Or my good, my, my example. My example of that one. God, it's my brain. I need to go to sleep. Fucking, and I mean, like, now that New York is... Um, legalized weed mm. it's like even better there it's mm. awesome and it's actually not even the most expensive place to live in the country <laughs> thanks to san francisco so i yeah i see it um san francisco also is amazing um seattle people know these things though no that's what i'm saying i'm like if you're looking for like if you want queer and weed friendly in a big city like just go to one you pick one they're all the same essentially and like it's you know whatever but the cost of living is going to be high and the kinds of places that you can live are going to be limited and you're definitely going to need roommates like i mean maybe you won't you might not but you might (laughs) and if y'all are trying not to have roommates this person is saying that they're tired of living with three other people so i would maybe pick a smaller place in it in it okay so do you want to go to the next Mm -hmm. question yeah okay I thought you found this word really interesting. Any tips for moving from a stable living situation to a new place during doing new things? Yeah. Um, Well, I just think the concept of stability in housing and in in the concept of home is really interesting because you can live in the same place and it can be stable on the surface and it can be chaotic as fuck underneath. So like, I don't, I don't think that the definition is quite so clear for me anyway. Stable. 
stable. Yeah, I mean, I get what, you know, the new place, new things thing is really up mm -hmm. for me here. I was driving down the street in this town that we live in. And like I had driven down this particular street like a few times. It's one of the main drags. And I was like, oh, this street connects to that street this way. I get it now. And it's just like those kinds of things that happen over the course of time that has really led me to believe in all of my moving around that you really need to be somewhere for a year mm. before you feel like you know what's going on. And so the new place, new things question, I feel like is such a real question. And tips for moving from, reduce your expectations. <laughs> if you're going from something that you consider oh, yeah. stable, which sounds pretty chaotic, next door to your family with all the roommates and that, but recognize the ways that you're actually not stable and so you're gonna be fine. Mm. That's one thing. That you were always not stable. That you were always not stable. That yeah. it, all of the trembling is actually the balance. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I think we, I wanna really start telling people this, and I think this could be a message that We Go High talks about specifically, but you know, <sighs> And everybody has different levels of being okay with this, but you got to be weed friendly to yourself. Mm. You got to be friendly to weed. You know what I mean? Like everywhere you go, like you have to make yourself a state of prohibition. I mean, of of, uh, of ending prohibition. Why can't I talk? You have to be in a constant state of ending prohibition. That's real. That's what I was thinking about, like looking for a weed friendly place. It's yeah. like, you're probably going to have to make it weird, weed friendly <laughs> wherever right. you are. Yeah. And so we're all in a state of ac active activism. <laughs> That's right. We're living the path right now. And so for me, it's like, it's not about doing something different than you're clearly already doing. It's about like being <clears throat> clear that the thing that you're doing, where you're going, being queer, smoking weed, having a dog, those are things that you do to enrich your life and to live into your truth. And so that has to go with you everywhere. And if it's, it doesn't look like it's obvious where you're going, like that's your opportunity to make it true for somebody else, you know? And so I just charge you, charge all of us, all of us queers who are doing new things in new places to like really bring the spirit of that freedom with you mm -hmm. so that when you get there and you are just going to be at least unfamiliar for at least a year, if not uncomfortable even. Because mm -hmm. um, it's uncomfortable for me to not know where stuff is, to not know where people are to not, you know, to be like, oh my God, why is Google Maps saying it's an hour and 15 minutes to this place that's 36 minutes away? Because traffic's crazy and I don't know about it and what mm -hmm. times and I don't think about it the same way. So I'm not even from here, you know. So different things like that are kind of annoying. <clears throat> but lowering, lowering the expectations when you go to a new place on everybody except yourself being able to do it, you know, I feel like you can do it. And it's it's keeping that with each other, reminding each other when it's really hard mm. that we got this. This is hard. It was going to be hard. It was always going to be hard. So it's kind of like that, like moving the way that's, that I think the question is phrased to me just makes me want to reassure you that it will be hard and it will be harder if you decide it is. <laughs> and it'll be easier if you decide it is, you know. So, so you have a lot of agency there that you may not know about because I forget all the time. Mm -hmm. So I think the word stable comes... I don't know if you wanted to say anything about that. Sorry to move on. No, I mean, I think also like there's a lot that could be said. I mean, there are a lot of tips, I think, or a lot of things to think about. But yeah. I feel like the thing that you were just saying about, um, well, what I, what came up for me was yeah. thinking that if you are making a transition with another person and like y'all are going into a lack mm. of stability together that it's helpful when you can to not blame them for the discomfort mm. or to yeah. uh, problematize their experience. And that is something that I know that I have done and that I do and is something that Me too. I think is probably just a lesson and a thing to bear witness to. Yeah. But Except about oneself. Yeah, I think it makes it a lot worse if you problematize the person that you're in partnership with because they are ultimately, y'all are like going to hold each other down. And I feel like it's a whole other kettle of fish to do it alone. Like mm -hmm. if you are not with somebody else. Pros and like, cons though in both. Terms, absolutely. You know, I mean, making Literally. completely autonomous decisions in a brand new place mm -hmm. is this really cool act of coming in to yourself as a new, per as a this age person, exactly. you know, like. I, I can't, I don't speak from experience. I don't think, I don't think I've ever been in a new, well, I moved back from Puerto Rico and moved in to an apartment by myself. So that felt like a shift to come back to Durham from um, being gone in such a far away way. Maybe it's back to that 
begin you know top of the show conversation about um performance mm -hmm. i think you can just reinvent the character mm. when you go somewhere by yourself but when you go with another person it's a whole different it's like not even that's not even really on the radar it wasn't for me at least unless so, y'all are doing it together no so this is a question that i would have for you is like when we came out here i had thought maybe it's time for ash to just be to just do to just be out here and like single single literally and like to no mask or i mean like i don't know it's, it's single is a hard concept for me because like you we're talking about like going to a place and uh being by yourself and i'm like i definitely have moved to towns where i was like and have left have lived alone yeah <laughs> but I was in partnership with someone. We didn't live together, but like I was with someone and even without her, like I had friends. So like I had community yeah. and I feel like it's really different to be like totally not in partnership with anyone, maybe no close family yeah. moving to a 100% new place and you just are doing a new thing. But like, well, <clears throat> excuse me. I feel like the that's like running away though low-key is it no not necessarily. life earns you different shit like you might get a job in a place and then like you good go and you but then you have coworkers, like... but like you, they're not your community yet like yeah. you, they become your community but like you go there and you're just like a whole new thing okay but this is my question for you Me, <laughs> it's please. like do you feel like you would be having a different do you want an experience here in California, wherein you are reinventing yourself in a way that is different from how you're able to reinvent yourself with someone who you are in partnership with. And okay, go ahead. I'm just wondering if the, you know, actually, never mind. Okay, the the answer is twofold. Number one, um, my girlfriend and I did talk before we got here. We were just talking about like, what's whatever i don't actually remember what the prompt was but something that led to the answer of like both of us agreeing that new relationship energy and new relationships offer us all the opportunity to like take a bunch of the skills that we've learned in our life leading up to this in either in communication or in relationships in general and then applying them like from the beginning in this new relationship you know and that that's a really attractive thing about new relationship energy that you can like sort of identify some of the values that maybe other people don't think of you having because they have known you for 15 years, maybe a slightly different way, but that this person doesn't have any expectations. And so the way you live into your values around them is sort of reinforced as opposed to sort of like finding moments of regressing to like a different way of experiencing your own values. Because I feel like even when I betray my values, I'm like engaging with my values one way mm -hmm. or another, you know, but um. And so that to answer, sort of answers your, I mean, is one answer to your question around like, I mean, yeah, I am doing that. Because like you came out here with a girlfriend that was out here who had a preconceived, y'all had a pre-existing relationship sure. and that would be a part of, even if you and I weren't living together, there would still be like an anchor point of like something same happening. Or I would mm -hmm. think theoretically, and I would think that like it's... So that it wouldn't be you like a hundred percent new place, like yeah. no partner, just doing a thing. And like, yeah. So I don't know. It doesn't feel, I guess. You're saying, do I want to live alone? Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Out here. Yeah. Um, you know, you were gone the last three days mm -hmm. and I was like tasting some of like what, you know, not waking up with and planning a day around the schedule of another person. In, at least in some part um, and looking forward to I mean that was the other thing is like I look forward to like meals with you I look forward to you know it's like if I'm getting through a long meeting it's like we're gonna smoke weed after this like I look forward to the pieces of our being together that I enjoy it's been maybe the first time I mean I lived alone like maybe one other time like right when I moved back from Puerto Rico I was 19 mm -hmm. um, but I haven't really lived alone since that I can recall I think I have so much work to do. I have so many projects. I have so much creative energy inside me that I don't play with mm -hmm. because I have this knee jerk reaction to not ever spend time by myself, but it's creative energy that can only be experienced alone. You know, it's like writing. 
which I could do in the space with somebody else, but I won't. I'll talk or, you know, creating audio projects or editing film, whatever. It's just stuff that's not communal. And I, even this week, found myself like really being like reaching for the like, oh, come hang out with me person or oh, come hang out with, you know, when like I could have really used in the, in the, and I had huge pockets of time that I was by myself. I adored it. This happens every time. And it's so funny. I've even said it on the show where I'm like, oh, man, I, I chose to hang out with somebody who I really wanted to be alone. And I regret it. But I, I don't know. I'm not at a place yet where I can. Uh, this week, I, 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 didn't, I didn't choose a great deal of alone time over being with people. I think you leaving and coming back when you're going for work or whatever and not because you're like mad at me or did something bad. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that is cool. Mm-hmm. Um, I enjoy it. Just a just taste of autonomy. But no, I don't prefer solitude. I don't really reach for aloneness. I, you know, I feel pretty lonely and, and uncomfortable with it a lot of the time. I do think that there are a lot of lessons through solitude that you can only learn in it. Um, and I find that so to your point, I was out of town for um a couple days earlier this week. And that time alone was really I think helpful for me in different ways. I appreciate spending time by myself and um, I missed you the whole time. And I love spending time with you. It's like my favorite thing. I love it so much. And it's like, it is the joy of my life. One of the many big joys of my life that I get to work with you every day Mm -hmm. and that we get to align in this particular way. It, it's nice to miss it too. It's nice to miss Definitely. the proximity. Right. So like that is what I appreciate about the alone time. And even here, like having the camper mm-hmm. and then you having a room here in the house, mm-hmm. I think is really good for us to have those like separate spaces where we each have our own time. And like how you spend your time is how you spend your time. Mm -hmm. But um, I know that I have in the last month, especially not been choosing to spend a lot of time alone. Mm -hmm. I've been opting to spend a lot of time with you and it has caused, I think many problems in our relationship. It's (laughs) definitely offered space for conflict. (laughs) That is exactly right. The spaciousness uh, creates breathing room. What I was thinking was that when we first um, when we first got home, like I you revealed some things to me about what you'd been doing while I was gone. Mm -hmm. And it upset me because of a bunch of reasons that I don't really know that we need to go into right now. But what it made me feel eventually was that. I needed to spend time to myself Mm -hmm. and not even that I needed to spend time away from you, but that I needed to spend time with myself. Mm -hmm. That the reason that I was upset with you was that you had not behaved the way that I wanted you to Mm -hmm. behave or Mm -hmm. the way that I thought that you had behaved and whether or not like there's this whole thing about like lying and truth and and omitting. Exactly. deserves and who needs to know all the yeah exactly so like there's all this shit that like i know i can play a self-righteous game of like Mm. well you know but you told me this thing and like you lied about that Mm. thing but like ultimately it's that things didn't happen the way that i thought they were going to happen and like that is something that's an experience that i've been rolling with i can't learn that lesson so hard i gotta learn that shit every day of my life Mm. literally it comes up consistently since I got here (laughs) every age Mm. and this is just the form that it's taking now and it's taking this very painful form because it is that's the way that that's how hard my head is Mm. so like I feel like the reminder though was that and this is also to the question of home and like stability and shit Mm -hmm. is that the home that I am seeking, the place where I can find myself is inside of this. It is not in you period. And like, I can try and I do try Mm -hmm. (laughs) to find myself in you and in our partnership and like feeling so fulfilled through that identity, Mm -hmm. but it is not it it is not the whole of it it is a piece of it that is true Mm. but it's not all of it and so being able to like even just go unpack my suitcase in the camper and be like 
this is just i'm just just doing i'm just doing this thing for me and it don't have anything to do with her or anybody else it's literally just i'm just doing this for me mm. and like that kind of realignment is i think actually the reinvention that we were talking about before yeah, that's right. because i feel like i'm constantly reinventing myself totally. but i'm in i'm a different person moment by moment mm -hmm. to moment moment by moment i am a different human being mm -hmm. and i don't have to explain that to anybody right. and i literally can't so like ultimately it's just gonna be that i'm tuning into whatever i'm doing and that um like i can do that in partnership with someone else i can do that from any location whether the house is moving or not mm -hmm. and it is a lot harder to do when you're constantly moving in some ways or yeah in some nature ways. tuning into nature and my body that is a true story exclusively the rv to that the degree that i that's the most i ever have every single day I want to go. Oh my God. We need to go to Joshua Tree. Definitely. But you know what happened today? I was, I took a nap in the camper and you came in there to say you were going to run an errand or something, which I really appreciate, by the way. I really mm. appreciate the con, just like the, hey, I'm going to go run an errand instead of like a, even just like a text or a note, if you can. I said, I can't wait to get back in here with you. And mm -hmm. you said, I miss being in here with you too. Well, because I feel like I'm in the camper pretty regularly. Like yeah. I, I feel like you will go weeks without being in the camper and like i am still over there so that i'm like i'm and i know that you consider it home too mm -hmm. but like i don't see you there and so i'm like i miss being in here with you too like i feel like it is a completely different vibe it's yeah. a the house is the house feels like an office to me mm. like which i appreciate about it no when y'all when you did a photo shoot in the bedroom as it's set up the other day i was like oh i see how the bedroom is also kind of an office <laughs> <laughs> it is it's all studio space which makes yeah. sense well how do you feel about that though i mean yeah i don't actually you know it's actually this is an amazing question i feel like both the r the rv started the like pickle jar that wouldn't open mm -hmm. and the the house really was just like the very last turn for me of like not <laughs> being so invested in how the place mm. affects my ability to be okay or something like mm -hmm. i don't know you saying that i was like you know what i can't care anymore <laughs> yeah i don't know it's just like i think i want to care more about things that i'm making things that i'm yes. experiencing things that i'm like that are enriching my life or something i don't know that is it that i just it. i just don't want to be derailed by it anymore or in the ways that i have or like use it as an excuse i don't want to be like well you know i moved a lot as a kid so i really I just want to be like yeah that's part of my story and here we are and i have something to go shoot or record or you know i just want to be living my life in in conjunction with that truth you know you had an incredible preparation for this in your oh, childhood yeah, totally. that's right i mean it's just all like everything is disintegrating you know mm -hmm. all of these things all of the society that we live in is falling apart mm -hmm. and so right. it's not necessary i think to hold on to these structures in the same way that we always have i think it is about the experiences it's about the art it's about the creative output just being mm -hmm. Mm, the third question on this sheet was actually, what is it like going from an RV back to stable, stable living, which mm -hmm. um, maybe back to your point a little bit, like the stable living, like I just said, has to come from inside you because our society is falling apart. And so you could get somewhere, rent a house, buy a house, buy land, even shit goes wild. And then it's still new place, new things, mm -hmm. even if it's the same place doing old things you know so like i think it's about right like questioning that idea of stable maybe a little bit just being like a little bit lower expectations mm -hmm. <laughs> in general yeah um but going from an rv back to to a house we're sort of still in the rv and we're sort of still um not stable i don't know <laughs> <laughs> yeah totally um, i feel like yeah what do you think yeah i think stability is relative totally 
And um, I think that the RV is, I mean, if, I don't know that it's any less stable than this house That's is. Right. Totally. And I think that the framing maybe is like, what's it like going from RV back to sticks and bricks? Like hardwire internet is everything. In it's amazing. Everything. So great. But I would, I would like to see more of the stars. Mm-hmm. And more trees mm -hmm. more mountains more lakes let's just leave it at that yeah okay cool <laughs> uh see ya goodbye dear jessamine is produced by tender fire media for more on our show follow us on spotify and instagram at dear jessamine or head over to our website dear jessamine.com if you're an apple podcast person you can subscribe to our show and while you're there write us a review they really help us out a lot, and they give you a place to let folks know how you feel about our show. Here's our team. Kylie C. Roberts is our editor slash producer. Angel Foster and Naya Williams do our social media. Jamie Lepper draws our art, and Fruit Snack plays our theme song. Montez Mickles is our director of production. Anna Rooney is my chief of staff. Amber Richardson is Ash's chief of staff. Ash Danger Phoenix is my co-host and co-producer, and I am Jessamine Stanley. And we believe that no one should be in jail for weed. Tender fire. Drop page.